The defendants set out to destroy what Kevin and I had created and built. An inspired, happy, thriving family. But she failed. What actually happened is the defendant destroyed her own family. On October 25th, 2012, a New York mom raised home after repeated attempts to reach her nanny went unanswered. They were supposed to meet at her daughter's dance class, but when she arrived, she learned that her daughter had never made it. She would have to be sedated after discovering the scene inside her apartment that evening. The Krim family had it all. Husband Kevin was a loving father, Harvard graduate, and a CNBC executive. His wife Marina was a beloved teacher who encouraged her children's creativity. So when the family moved from San Francisco to New York City in 2010, they easily adapted to the fast pace of the city. Marina still taught art part-time, but she spent most of her time being a stay-at-home mom and running a blog centered around mothering the Krim children. They lived in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in all of New York City. So it's no surprise that Marina interacted with lots of nannies at her children's activities. So one day when a nanny approached a pregnant Marina at a dance class asking if she needed a nanny, it wasn't unusual. Marina was very hands-on in her parenting, but she knew with another child on the way, she could use the help in the afternoon for school pickups, activity drop-offs, and nap time. The woman's name was Claudia Ortega, and she said her sister was an experienced nanny. And with that, they exchanged information. And with that, the family was doomed, despite taking all the proper precautions. Kevin compiled a list of questions for an interview for the potential nanny. And days later, Marina met and interviewed a Yoselin Ortega. The interview went well, and to top it off, she had excellent references. Yoselin was welcomed into the family, working 20 hours a week at $18 an hour cash. The three children, six-year-old Lulu, three-year-old Nessie, and two-year-old Leo, became very comfortable with Yoselin Ortega. In fact, the family treated her as their own, even paying for her flight to go back to the Dominican Republic. Furthermore, they liked her so much, they affectionately called her Josie and even took a vacation to the Dominican Republic with her and met her family but their kindness would not be reciprocated for long. October 25th, 2012 was just like every other day. Crispy, cool autumn air, the city was bustling like always, with the holidays right around the corner. Yoselin arrived at the apartment right on time at 3 p.m. She was to take Leo to go pick up Lulu from school and drop her off at dance class, and then return back to the apartment for Leo's nap and Marina would take three-year-old Nessie to swim class, and then when class was over, she would pick up Lulu from dance and return home to the apartment on the Upper West Side. But when Marina arrived to Lulu's dance class around 5 p.m., she learned that Lulu never made it to class that day. Immediately, Marina felt a pit in her stomach, and she texted Yoselin asking where she was, but her texts would go unanswered. She was, of course, very concerned, so she went straight home with Nessie. When she opened the door to the second floor apartment, it was silent. She saw Leo's stroller and Lulu's dance bag, but the kids were nowhere to be seen. She also noticed it was dark in the apartment, more than usual. She went back down to the first floor and asked the doorman if he'd seen Yoselin and the kids, but he hadn't. The next few minutes would change her life forever. She grabbed Nessie by the hand and went back upstairs. They entered the quiet apartment, and upon going from room to room, she noticed a sliver of light coming from under the bathroom door. When she opened the door, she saw her two babies stacked on top of one another in the bathtub that was covered in blood. Marina screamed what would be described as inhuman noises. Yoselin was sitting on the floor, and as soon as she saw Marina's reaction, Yoselin plunged a knife into her own neck. By this time, the building super, who lived below the family and heard Marina's screams, ran up to see if everything was okay. He went to the bathroom and saw what he would later describe as the devil, saying her eyes were bulging out. Once he made sure that Marina and Nessie were out of the apartment, he held onto the outside of the apartment door 
and positioned his body in a way that nobody inside could get out. He would stay barricading the door until police arrived, and he would tell them that, quote, whatever is behind that door is pure evil. Marina was utterly hysterical, living every parent's worst nightmare. She would say she didn't know it was humanly possible for her body to make those noises. She had to be sedated. The scene that she had witnessed was just too much for the mother to bear. Kevin was away on a business trip in San Francisco, and at the time everything was unfolding, he was mid-flight on his way home and had no idea. But his world was soon to be forever changed. As soon as his plane landed and he turned on his phone, he was bombarded with messages and voicemails. His horror began by knowing something tragic had happened, and his children died, but he had no idea which kids or how it even happened. That is, until officers came and escorted him off the plane before any other passengers. Once off the plane, they confirmed the heartbreaking news. He recalled going into shock, unsure if he even walked out of the airport or if he was carried. The nanny would be rushed to the hospital, unresponsive from her self-inflicted stab wounds. As she lay in the hospital recovering, she would be able to communicate with police by using a letter board. Now, police would testify that the first communication from Yoslin was her complaining about working for the Crims. This would be crucial information used to poke holes in the defense's arguments. She stabbed Leo five to six times, nearly decapitating him. But Lulu didn't go down easy. She fought back, and as a result of this, she was stabbed nearly 30 times. Yoselin and her defense attorneys would try to argue that she was mentally ill and she heard voices prompting her to stab the children. Now, mental illness is not something to take lightly, but the prosecution would easily dismantle this argument in a number of ways. First, Kevin and Marina testified that in the entire two years she worked for them, they never saw any indication of mental illness. Also, on the days before the killings, Yaselin had a conversation with her sister about taking care of her son and raising him well. And on the day that she planned to kill the kids, she got rid of her phone and organized her documents and family heirlooms in a bag and hung it on a door at the home she shared with her son and her sister's family. All of this proving that she had not planned to come home that day. And most importantly, the defense proved that this wasn't a spur of the moment psychotic break by the way, Yoselin waited until she knew that she would be alone with the children and have time to carry out her evil plan. The doorman testified that when she came into the apartment building that afternoon with the children, she spoke to him for the first time in the entire two years that she worked for the family. She asked him if the kids and the mother were upstairs. She wanted to make sure that she'd be completely alone. It was said in court that she was upset over house cleaning she was asked to do. But Marina testified that prior to the murders, Yoselin had told her that she needed more money. And while Marina didn't need her for more hours, she did offer her an extra $100 a week for five hours house cleaning if she wanted. Apparently, Yoselin was resentful that she offered this instead of just giving her money. That coupled with how she complained about Marina in the hospital and waiting in the bathroom so she could see Marina's reaction before trying to take her own life. It became clear that she was angry with Marina the day of the murders. Yaselin's defense would tell the court about how days before her evil acts, she had an emergency session with a psychologist. Now he would take the stand saying that during the session, she talked about financial stress, struggles with her son and sister, as well as health concerns. He said she never mentioned hearing voices, having hallucinations, or anything that would lead him to think she could be on the verge of a psychotic break. He said she seemed like a normal, stressed out woman. In addition, there would be another bombshell in court. Yaselin's family had helped to falsify her work history. This was huge. She had never worked as a nanny before, and a relative had posed as her reference to the Crims. On April 18th, 2018, Yaselin Ortega would be found guilty of first and second degree murder and sentenced to life without parole. Parents Kevin and Marina would go on to do great things in the kids' memory. They set up the Lulu and Leo Fund, which provides education and the creative arts for underserved children. They were also able to pass legislation known as the Lulu and Leo's Law, 
which made it a crime to falsify qualifications if a person is applying for a job in the child care sector. Incredibly, they were able to keep their family together, even welcoming two new children in the years following. And they continue to this day, keeping the memory alive of Lulu and Leo. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.